Good evening, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us on this brisk January night. Um, happy beginning to the semester. My name is Ashley Farrow Murray, and I am the curator of dance and theater here at MPAC. And I also run our talk series. Um, this is the first talk series of the spring semester, or first talk event. And it's my absolute pleasure to welcome Dr. Jennifer Ree uh, from Virginia Commonwealth University, Terence Lear, um, to give a talk this evening. Um, Jennifer is a associate professor of English at VCU um, and also currently has a fellowship from the American Council for, of Learned Societies and is here specifically to talk about this book or at least um, content adjacent to it, The Robotic Imaginary, The Human and the Price of Dehumanized Labor. Um, and I'm thrilled that Market Block Books from downtown Troy has come up to also host a book signing after the talk in Evelyn's Cafe. So I hope you'll be able to join us afterwards for some light refreshments and also the opportunity to talk a little bit more uh, with Jennifer about some of the concepts that she'll share with us this evening. Um, it was my pleasure to get to work with Jenny a little bit more uh, over the last year. She's currently co-editing a piece, um, a volume um, called Informatics of Domination, which will be kind of a companion piece to Donna Haraway's Cyborg Manifesto. And um, she's collaborating with two scholars who are um, really thinking about artist-scholar conversations across these different principles um, that Haraway includes in that manifesto. And so I've actually collaborated with Justin Shoulder, who's a former MPAC artist in resident on one of them, and Kathy High, who's a faculty member here at Rensselaer, is also working on one of them. Um, and so through that project, I was sort of sparked to revisit some of Jenny's work and really start thinking about it through the lens of MPAC, since I hadn't quite looked at it since I'd arrived here. And I was reminded by how kind of uncannily her scholarship embodies the, the hopes of this lecture series, which is really to bring conversations about um, development in science and engineering, along with the arts and humanities, uh, science and technology studies together, um, and look at the ways that these different disciplines and conversations come together, put pressure on one another, um, and that that is really at the heart of this work. Um, so I'm, I'm thrilled to be able to welcome Jenny here to share more in depth about how this scholarship kind of embodies the nexus of these things that are so close to us uh, within MPAC and then also across Rensselaer, a DARPA-funded institute that also has uh, cutting edge research on the edges of politics, arts, science and thinking and thought. So without further ado, um, the warmest of welcomes to Jenny, who, who flew up uh, from Atlanta just this morning. So help me to welcome Jenny, and we'll look forward to taking a couple of questions after the talk and then joining um, in the cafe after that. And thank you all for coming tonight. And thank you, Ashley, for such a wonderful um, introduction. Um, I'm so excited for you all to, to um, be able to read um, Ashley and Kathy's pieces in this volume that she mentioned once the, the book does come out. They're, they're quite stunning. So, um, And I didn't know this was a... Um, a that um, DARPA had a presence here, which is really interesting. And, and we can maybe... Um, which might bring out some interesting... Um, questions and, and uh, conversations uh, during the talk, so. All right, so um, I also wanted to thank uh, a number of people who were instrumental in uh, uh, sorting out the logistics uh, for my visit, uh, Dorothy, Janelle, Ian, Michael, and Aaron, um, and also um, the wonderful tech team here who, who, had, who got us all set up, um, Sarah, Ryan, Eric, Steve. Um, okay. So I'm going to begin by talking a little bit about my new book, An AI Assistance, um, Siri, Alexa, um, and then move into a longer discussion about drone warfare and drone art. As Ashley mentioned, my talk is drawn from my book, The Robotic Imaginary, The Human and the Price of Dehumanized Labor, 
In this book, I, imagine the, uh, I examine the intersections of race, gender, and labor in AI and robotics technologies, as well as in visual and performance art, literature, and film. And some of you might recognize this image um, of one of my favorite robots. This is Robot K456 by artist, uh, Korean artist uh, Nam Joon Paik. In this talk, I'm going to highlight how certain AI systems reflect societal norms about whose labor is valued and therefore unautomatable, whose labor is replaceable by robots, and whose freedom from certain forms of undesirable work and suffering is prioritized. So in a lot of ways, this, uh, this touches on these questions that we hear a lot in the media about, oh, robots are going to take our jobs, right? Um, these questions about labor and freedom have everything to do with who's considered human and who isn't. So in my research, I ask, how is the human defined in these technological systems? What are the histories of labor that brought this imagined human into being? Whose labors and whose lives are excluded from this conception of the human? In other words, who is dehumanized? Ethnic studies scholar Lisa Lowe highlights that the modern concept of freedom has historically depended on the considerable unfreedoms of minoritized groups. In other words, freedom has only been reserved for certain humans and always at the expense of other humans. AI and robotic systems reflect this history by highlighting whose lives society has historically valued and wants to reward with freedom from labor, and whose continued unfreedom is required to deliver liberation to those who are valued. In my book, I examine AI and robotic systems such as AI assistants, the vacuum cleaning Roomba, and Cynthia Brazil's groundbreaking emotional robots, as well as armed military drones, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. I examine how each technological system reflects historic gendered and racial devaluations around the human and labor. For example, let's look at AI assistants, such as AI assistants such as Alexi and Alexa and Siri reflect these racial and gender dimensions of what's known as care labor, which means forms of labor that involve caring for another person's physical, emotional, and educational well-being. This labor can be paid, teachers, healthcare providers, social workers. Um, it can also be unpaid, um, conducted by parents, family, and friends. Care labor is, of course, important work, but historically has not been valued as work, in large part because the people who have done this work have often been women. This gender devaluation is reflected in an early AI assistant, Eliza, an AI therapist created by Joseph Weizenbaum. And here's a version of Eliza you can, f you can find online. Um, uh, as, as you might notice in this conversation I had with Eliza, she wasn't that helpful. Um, Eliza was developed in the early 1960s when psychotherapeutic professions were undergoing a significant shift in demographics, with white women increasingly entering the profession. The barriers for women of color's participation in this field continued for quite some time after. As more white women became practicing psychotherapists, the profession saw lower wages and lower status. This shift in which more women entering a profession equals lower status and lower wages is a familiar trend in many fields. Eliza also reflects another ongoing trend in which devalued work conducted largely by white women, people of color, immigrants, and the working class is more readily targeted for automation. Of course, this gender devaluation also has a racial component in history. In the US, people of color, particularly women of color, have made up a significant amount of the care labor workforce. And as women's participation in various care labor professions increased throughout the 20th century, the kinds of work available to women differed along racial lines. For example, in the second half of the 20th century, white collar positions characterized by secretarial and managerial work were largely available only to white women. These front of house positions often involve clerical work and face to face interactions with clients and customers. In contrast, back of house positions were lower waged and lower status positions that required physical work like cleaning and didn't involve customer or client interactions. These lower status positions and their association with what's known as dirty work have been disproportionately held by black, Latina, and Asian women. While there's much to examine about Alexa's and Siri's gendered programming and interactions in the present, these gender dimensions are inseparable from their racial inscriptions, specifically their inscriptions of whiteness, 
and the historic racial stratification of care labor professions these AI systems extend into our present. As we attend to the racial dimensions of AI's automation of labor, we want to be careful not to universalize whiteness, thus further perpetuating the persistent erasure of women of color and their labors. So I suggest that we ask of robot and AI figures the following questions. How does this technological system engage histories of undervalued, devalued, and exploited labor, particularly as they intersect with race, gender, sexuality, and class? Whose humanness is constructed as unquestioned and sacred, and who is dehumanized? And going forward, how can we challenge AIs and robotics dehumanizing impulses? These questions underscore the crucial role of the humanities and the arts in analyzing and shaping robotics and AI's technological practices and imagined futures. Indeed, the ethical, political, and philosophical questions highlighted by, these, by the humanities and arts are essential considerations for AI and robotics' continued de development and application, particularly as more and more of our lives are being mapped, surveilled, controlled, and policed by AI systems, with all of these systems' biases around race, gender, and sexuality. And now, drones. I describe drone warfare as the labor of racial dehumanization. In this section, I'll begin by demonstrating that racial dehumanization is embedded in both the present of drone policies and technology and in the earlier history of cybernetic science, which significantly influenced AI and robotics. Then I'll offer discussion of drone art, which I define as artworks that explicitly respond to contemporary drone warfare. I'll focus on drone art that draws connections between overseas drone strikes and the history and present of state-sanctioned racial violence within the US. Without collapsing the different histories of the United States and countries in Africa and the Middle East subjected to drone strikes, and without collapsing the different constructions of racialized others that emerge from these different histories, I highlight how these artworks point to a broader racial violence at work that affirms the continued dominance and global reach of the figure of the Western post-enlightenment subject, as discussed by Denise De Silva, an artist and scholar of critical race and ethnic studies. The figure of this Western post-enlightenment subject is largely figured as white, male, straight, and abled, and is thought to possess a tremendous capacity for self-determination. For centuries, this particular subject has formed the basis of dominant definitions of the human in Western thought, including in AI and robotics. Historically, this figure has operated as the model against which other humans have been measured. If someone resembled this model, they were considered human, with all the rights, privileges, and protections that accorded them. If someone didn't resemble this model, for example, in terms of race, gender, sexuality, or disability, they were ejected from the human community, often with stakes that were nothing short of life and death. The drone artworks I'll discuss challenge conceptions of the human that presume the humanity of the Western post-enlightenment subject at the explicit expense of all those who are outside this narrow yet powerful conception of the human. In October 2001, the US conducted its first drone strike. Since then, drone warfare has been an active part of US military action, though much of drone warfare has taken place in countries against which the US has not formally declared war. There's tremendous disagreement about the official number of civilians killed by US drones. For example, official Pakistani sources estimate that in 2009 alone, approximately 700 Pakistani civilians were killed by drone strikes. The Bureau of Investigative Journalism offers a similar estimate. The US's official civilian death toll is much, much, much lower. Fewer than 10 civilian deaths in Pakistan between 2001 and 2012. So we have approximately 700 in, in one year and then versus less than 10 across 11 years. The large disparity in civilian death tolls emerges from the US's method of counting who is a civilian and who is an enemy combatant. According to US drone policy, a military-aged male, that's a technical term, military-aged male, is defined as any boy or man who is an adolescent or older, so anyone who's no longer a child. Any military-aged male who is killed in a drone strike is classified as an enemy combatant, unless posthumous evidence to the contrary is provided. <laughs> 
It should be noted that the U.S. doesn't routinely investigate the identities or the ages of those killed by its drone strikes and has no procedure in place to determine whether someone who was killed was a civilian or an enemy combatant. The U.S.'s consideration of all military-aged males as enemy combatants raises the question of how certain human lives are counted and others discounted, and how some lives are expelled from the protected category of the human in their apparent killability and death by drone. The racial dehumanization that structures drone warfare can be traced to early cybernetics. Early cybernetics was entrenched in wartime research, specifically during World War II. One need only look to, cy to founding cybernetician Norbert Wiener and his early research on anti-aircraft defense systems for a direct conversation between cybernetics and militarized interests. Historian of science Peter Gallison characterizes cybernetics as a war science and argues that this wartime context significantly shaped the development of cybernetics and its continued influence in contemporary culture and war. Gallison traces this legacy to the early stages of Wiener's wartime work, which involved tracking and predicting the flight patterns of enemy German pilots. For this work, Allied soldiers were asked to participate in simulation exercises in which they inhabited the position of the German enemy other. They put themselves in the shoes of the enemy other or identified with the enemy other in order to calculate and predict the enemy's future behavior. For the purposes of Wiener's research, the enemy other was composed of a hybrid of German pilot and his aircraft. Through the simulation exercise, this hybridized human machine other was incorporated into the allied pilot's subjectivity and then into cybernetics' influential vision of the human. Gallison calls this other the cybernetic other. The cybernetic other continues to drive cybernetics' great legacy, which is the collapse of boundaries between human and machine, as illustrated by figures such as the Terminator, the Bionic Woman, and Iron Man inexplicably eating a donut. Um, Gallison distinguishes this cybernetic other from a different wartime enemy other. This latter enemy other, not the cybernetic others that we just um, saw here, um, this latter enemy other embodied in the Japanese soldier was not incorporated into the allied subject, nor into cybernetics conception of the human. This other enemy other, which was characterized by the allies as lice, ants, or vermin, was viewed as, quote, barely human, end quote, or perhaps not human at all. So the cybernetic other and the influential vision of the human, um, it continues to inform, emerged from the exclusion of certain people from the category of the human on the basis of racial difference. Gallison describes that, Unlike with the dehumanized Japanese enemy other, quote, there is no sense in which Wiener sees the German Brahmer pilot as a racially lesser being, end quote. Wiener's research, as part of the founding history of cybernetics, is thus entangled with the exclusion and dehumanization of racialized subjects, an entanglement that finds full force in the U.S.'s military drone policies and drone technologies today. Like Wiener's anti-aircraft research, drones also seek to predict the behavior of the enemy other. However, the drones' processes of prediction function differently, as the racialized discourses of the global war on terror demonstrate, as does the asymmetry of the drone relation, that is, the tremendous difference in immediate risk of physical harm for the drone operator as opposed to for their targets. Of course, this says nothing about the risk of considerable risk of, of uh, post-traumatic stress disorder for drone operators, which I'll talk about um, later in this talk. Drone technology and policy don't ask drone operators to identify with or put themselves in the place of the enemy other of drone strikes because this enemy other is already constructed as the racial other. With drones, there is no identification with the other of drone strikes. Through the eyes of the drone, there is no blurring of boundaries with the racial enemy other. There's only dehumanization. Oops. Um, in the rest of this talk, I'm going to look at um, a few works of drone art. Um, these artworks propose various ways to counter the racial dehumanization of drone victims, which includes those who have been killed by drone strikes, those who have been wounded, those whose loved ones have been killed, and those who are traumatized by living under the constant threat of drone violence. <laughs> 
My discussion will highlight the ways that artistic responses to drone strikes separate identification from ethical possibility and action. The artworks I'll discuss assert the limits of identification and its close relation empathy, and instead posit an ethical relation outside of identification, outside of empathy, outside of familiarity to the figure of the white Western subject, and outside of racial hierarchies. Instead, these artworks highlight just how much identification and empathy in the drone relation is constructed by race and racial hierarchies, and by perceptions of proximity to the figure of the white Western subject. Esam Atiyah's street art does this powerfully by gesturing to connections between racial state violence and overseas drone strikes and in police killings of black men and women in the US. The street art of Atiyah, who works under the name Esam, uh, responds to drone strikes by explicitly connecting US overseas drone policy to existing domestic practices of racial discrimination and violence by the state. In 2012, Atiyah, a former military geospatial analyst in Iraq, installed over 100 posters in bus stops around Manhattan. He was um, arrested um, and the trial went on for, for several years until he was um, uh, acquitted after uh, uh, kind of incredibly uh, strenuous uh, legal, uh, legal battle. Um, these posters depict the silhouette of a drone um, on, on the right, um, presumably the property of the NYPD firing a missile at a fleeing family. His street signs, which also bear the name of the NYPD, similarly imagine drone strikes in use in New York by the police. For example, the sign shown here mimicking official street sign typography reads, attention, authorized drone strike zone, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., including Sunday. And another, not pictured here, um, is placed underneath existing Department of Transportation signs denoting parking restrictions. And this sign reads, attention, local statutes enforced by drone. By imagining drone strikes as regular everyday events conducted by the NYPD, at least between the hours of 8 a.m. and 8 p.m., the posters and signs stage the normalization of drone strikes within the U.S. and draw attention to the role of race in both overseas drone strikes and domestic state violence. Atiyah's work evokes the police department's fraught relationship with people of color, from the NYPD's surveillance of Muslim communities after 9-11, to the Stop and Frisk program, which disproportionately stopped black and Latino men, to the killing of black men by NYPD officers. By connecting the racial dehumanization of drone victims to formal and informal US domestic policies that discriminate against black and brown people, these artworks highlight the fundamental dehumanization undergirding drone strikes as a form of racial violence. Atiyah's work also highlights the technological intimacy between the US military and police departments, which are increasingly deploying military technology, including drones. In 2014, the New York Police Commissioner publicly voiced his interest in incorporating drone surveillance technology. And Houston and Las Vegas Police Departments tested surveillance drones as early as 2007. In 2015, North Dakota legalized the use of weaponized drones by law enforcement, while Connecticut has been debating legislation that would allow law enforcement to use lethally weaponized drones. As the use of drones for policing within the US increases, the connections highlighted by SM's work specifically the state's racialized targeting and killing in the US and overseas, um, takes on even greater resonance. James Bridle's dronestagram dis displays Google Earth satellite images of locations hit by drones. The work takes place on multiple social media platforms with iterations on Twitter, Instagram, which you see here, and Tumblr. The satellite images are accompanied by narrative accounts of each strike compiled from a variety of local journalistic sources. Dronestagram challenges popular but false narratives of drone omniscience by underscoring the limits of drone vision. Antoine Bousquet's discussion of cybernetic warfare points out that in contemporary war, everything is reduced to being known through measurement, quantification, and calculability. Uh, essentially, everything is reduced to a number. Bousquet, who is an historian of science, details that cybernetic warfare both emerges from and perpetuates, quote, fantasies of omniscience and omnipotence on the battlefield, end quote. As Bousquet describes, this cybernetic approach led to disastrous results for the US and the Vietnam War, and yet the allure of cybernetic warfare continues to shape contemporary war strategies and technologies. 
drones in their asymmetrical engagement with the enemy other may be cybernetic warfare's technology par excellence. As drones' aerial perspectives and seeming removal of human pilots from battle seductively speak to these fantasies of omniscience and omnipotence. In actuality, the drone is far from omniscient. In fact, drone vision is severely narrow and limited, as evidenced by drone technology and the racialized processes by which drone teams identify and misidentify military-aged males, thus killing, wounding, and traumatizing thousands of individuals. For example, in 2010, between 15 and 23 Afghan civilians in a wedding party were, mis were mistaken for enemy combatants and killed in a drone strike. This was after the civilians had been extensively surveilled for days. After the operation, Air Force General James Poss, who led the investigation into the attack, pointed to the dangers of the fantasy of drone omniscience. Poss suggested that in the 2010 drone strike, the magnitude of surveillance information, and there was a great deal of it, did not render a clearer picture of the situation. In fact, the amount of information rendered the picture more murky. According to Poss, quote, technology can occasionally give you a false sense of security that you can see everything, that you can hear everything, that you can know everything, end quote. In this situation, drone surveillance did not lead to greater understanding, but rather to tragic misapprehension, both of the technology's limitations and of those who were killed, whose cultural norms, many of which were unfamiliar to the drone team, were misread as terrorist activity. Dronestagram underscores the fallacy of this fantasy of drone omniscience by pointing to all the ways that drone vision cannot perceive. Google Earth images, as seen as Dronestagram, aren't taken in real time. So the, so the photos of the areas targeted by drone strikes were most likely taken well before the strike. Thus, the satellite images that we see here depict what no longer exists as such, a time before the strike. This temporal uncertainty illustrates a representational failure, as the image almost certainly captures a referent that no longer exists. While this temporal disorientation can certainly be said to characterize the medium of photography more generally, Dronestagram exploits photography's temporal dislocation to gesture to what was lost in the drone strike, what can no longer be apprehended as such. In the conversation between the image and the narrative accounts, Dronestagram stages a persistent conversation with the time before the drone strike. A disorientation emerges from the interplay between the narrative accounts of drone strikes and their aftermaths, and the work's multiple temporal gaps, from the ambiguous time that Google Earth images were taken, to the clearly stated dates of the strikes, to the timestamps indicating when Bridal uploaded the photos and narrative accounts, to the varied and multiple times of individuals viewing these, this on, on various social media sites. This multifaceted temporal dis disorientation underscores the significant limits of drone vision, which obscures much more than it sees, particularly in relation to the human. Dronestagram's depiction of a time before drone strikes unsettles, demonstrating the ways the image doesn't, or can't, depict that which it purports to see. By, by representing the failures of drone seeing, Dronestagram challenges both the authority of drone vision, as metaphorized by Google Earth satellite views, and the erroneous yet seductive fantasies of drone omniscience. In Dronestagram, the aerial image can only point to its own inadequacy to represent and to drone vision's inadequacy to see. In this context, drones, with their teasing promises of omniscience, don't help cut to cut through the fog of war that is, the confusions and uncertainties on the battlefield that accompany war practices. Rather, Dronestagram highlights that drones, as part of a larger technological and ideological apparatus, significantly contribute to the obscured vision referenced by the fog of war. Dronestagram also highlights that the aerial drone perspective is a dehumanizing one. The scale of drone technology, like the discourses around drone warfare and the global war on terror, presume the objecthood and killability of those the drone surveils. Like drone vision, the satellite image in Dronestagram is not scaled to the human, but to the dehumanized, the scale at which individuals are largely indistinguishable from each other and look more like dots or insects than humans. Indeed, drone operators often refer to humans on the ground as ants. So Dronestagram highlights that drone vision and the technological, political, and discursive apparatuses by which military drones see are not designed to see humans at all, 
but rather to surveil the already racially dehumanized enemy other. So those who fall under the drone, the eye of the drone, are not a priori human, but always already dehumanized targets. Dronestagram highlights the drone's perspective in its mediated accounts of drone violence through slick, bloodless interfaces on user-friendly social media platforms. Indeed, this is how Dronestagram challenges the ethical primacy of identification and empathy in relation to drone violence. Dronestagram's insistence on the dehumanizing drone perspective highlights the challenges, if not impossibility, of individuals to be viewed as human from the perspective of the drone. This is an intractable distance in the temporality and the scale of aerial machine perspective, as well as the asymmetry of the drone relation and the colonial histories that shape this relation. This intractable distance points to an inaccessibility of the other, and thus of identification in the drone relation. The incommensurability of Dronestagram's cool, sterile interfaces with the horror, chaos, and trauma generated by drone drone violence, as well as the abject failure of the satellite image to represent the human face of drone victims, all highlight the ways that drone vision itself is incompatible with the human. In Dronestagram, the viewer is encouraged to identify with the drone, which can't see the human as the human is erased, rendered invisible to the drone's aerial perspective. Dronestagram's aesthetic experience then leaves us with a heightened awareness of drone vision's dangerously expansive limits and its scalar incapacity to perceive the human. Dronestagram enacts these limits, as in this work, the viewer can only encounter what they can't apprehend and thus is subject to the dehumanizing limits of drone vision. In a 2005 article, journalist Noah Schachtman echoes this point in his description of a military drone training facility in Arizona. Schachtman describes U.S.-Mexico border patrol footage taken from a hunter drone 15,000 feet away. According to Schachtman, from that scale, the 80 Mexican immigrants who were being surveilled looked like germs and ants. Quote, especially when the anthill breaks apart and everybody scatters in a dozen directions, end quote. Schachtman's use of the word ants strikingly echoes current military jargon around drone surveillance, which refers to those killed by drones as bug splats. This language also recalls Allied forces' description of World War II Japanese soldiers as ants. This resonance underscores that dehumanizing and disidentifying racialized metaphors, as well as early cybernetic science, continue to shape militarized robotic technologies. The scale of drone vision further dehumanizes in its erasure of difference. This erasure creates a racialized homogeneity that collapses all individuals into a single indistinguishable threat. These dehumanizing erasures of difference are embedded in the drone's technological apparatus itself, as important local non-Western characteristics become illegible through the decidedly Western and Eurocentric socio-technological codes available to drone operators making assessments about risk. For example, um, assessments about clothing and other social customs. Not a Bug Splat is an installation by a group of Pakistani artists and French artist JR. And if you can see, um, this is uh, an image um, seen from um, an aerial perspective from a drone. And this earlier shot is one that's kind of offers a different scalar perspective of the same, in, same piece. This artwork fights this drone dehumanization at the level of scale by placing large-scale posters of Pakistani children outside where the child's face can be seen from drones flying overhead. The children's faces are appeals to the drone operators to see the humans who inhabit the area they surveil and target. And the work explicitly engages children, a protected category in US military drone policy. This work directly engages the dehumanizing scale of drone vision through a confrontation with the human face of a child. This direct confrontation with the child's face disorients the dehumanizing scale of drone vision and its metaphors. Indeed, drone vision, with its aerial perspective and its narrow classificatory codes, works to evade the scale at which such recognition of the other as human can take place. As the name of the project connotes, the artists, in collaboration with local citizens, combat the dehumanizing scale of drone vision in which humans appear more like little bugs than humans. 
The piece also challenges the dehumanizing military jargon that metaphorizes dead drone victims as bug splats. I'm going to turn now to a reading of a final work of drone art that brings the important issue of drone operators' post-traumatic stress disorder into conversation with drone warfare's racial dehumanization. According to Sarah Ahmed, who's a scholar of feminist, queer, and race studies, and is also a self-proclaimed feminist killjoy, um, orientations matter. Orientations matter because they establish paths and directions that shape worlds and the horizons of what is possible, both in the present and in the future. Thus, according to Ahmed, while orientations matter by bringing worlds into being, disorientations shatter and can lead to reorientations and new possibilities, if not new worlds and ethical possibilities. Omer Fast's short film, 5,000 Feet is the Best, uses disorientation to highlight race as the boundary between identification and dehumanizing disidentification in the drone relation. The film vacillates between encouraging and refusing identification, all the while highlighting the problematic centrality of the figure of the white Western subject within drone identification. This film is part of a larger installation piece that was exhibited at the Venice Biennale. The film disorientingly plays with identification and difference in a way that defamiliarizes what is purportedly familiar, thus laying bare the centrality of race in identificatory practices. The film produces an uneasy and uncertain experience by intercutting fictional vignettes with documentary elements. The fictional segments focus on a journalist's interview with a drone operator in a dark Las Vegas hotel room. The first few minutes of the interview repeat three times, taking a new narrative direction with each repetition. In these repetitions, the operator tells the interviewer three different stories, each a story a response to the question, what's the difference between you and someone who sits in an airplane? In the first story, a man breaks into a train station to drive a train. In the second story, a Las Vegas couple, a man and a woman, use seduction to trick men out of their pants and steal their credit card numbers. And in the third story, an American family on a weekend drive becomes collateral damage in a drone strike. These disjointed fictional segments are narrated with voiceover by the fictional drone operator and are intercut with documentary footage of Fast's interview with Brandon, a former drone operator struggling with post-traumatic stress disorder. And I should note that um, Former drone operators are some of the most kind of vocal and um, prominent activists against drone warfare um, to date. <clears throat> At every turn, the film resists identification by eluding closure and definitive meaning and disorienting the viewer on the level of genre and narrative. Through this disorientation, the film persist persistently refuses the viewer's immersion into the cinematic world despite drawing on numerous cinematic tro techniques, tropes, and genres to evoke familiarity. The fictional segments, in their looping repetitions and the operator's three disjointed stories, all speak to the failure of both cinematic representation and identification. However, the non-fictional interview segments, which feature the drone operator's blurred face and masked voice. This is not a, a technical error. This is the, a shot of the, the blurred face um, as you see it on the screen. These elements point to the possibility of a successful representation that must be thwarted. Brandon, seen here, is the only character in the film with a name, and yet his name is a pseudonym, which again deflects the promise and threat of representation success. As I'll discuss shortly, the fictional elements of the film convey that representation can't be trusted. At the same time, the non-fictional interview segments, with their intimations of a belief in representation, convey that even the mistrust of representation suggested by the film must be questioned. Disorientation indeed. As I mentioned earlier, the opening encounter between drone operator and interview is re interviewer is repeated three times. The repetition of this opening conversation disorients, all the more so because the repeated scene contains a sudden piercing noise that represents the drone operator's experience of a sharp stomach pain. This noise is loud and grating, simultaneously drawing the viewer into the private pain of the operator and jolting the viewer outside of the film to tend to their own significant physical discomfort. 
This simultaneous invitation into and propulsion out of the world of the film places the viewer on uncertain terrain, thus further speaking to the film's disorienting techniques. The film's most powerful disorientation center around race. In the fictional drone operator's first story, a young black boy is obsessed with model trains. As an adult, he steals a train conductor's uniform and key card, breaks into a train station, and takes a train through its daily route. He does so impeccably and receives a standing ovation at the end of his route. When he returns home, the young man realizes he forgot his house key. As he climbs into his house through a window, he gets arrested. At this point, the interviewer's voice breaks into the vignette and asks, OK, so why does a guy have to be black? The drone operator responds with, did I say he was black? Who said anything about color? At this moment, the film switches out the black actor with a white actor thus recasting the vignette in its final moments. This moment of racial disorientation hints at the third vignette, which brings drone strikes into direct conversation with racialized assumptions and the role of race in identification. In the opening of the third vignette, a white, suburban, straight American couple and their two children pile into their station wagon for a weekend trip. This archetypal scene of American suburban life soon becomes unfamiliar as the drone operator's voiceover narrates their journey from the driveway of their suburban neighborhood to checkpoints manned by occupying Chinese military. The voiceover narrates, quote, so the family drives down their quiet block on a weekend morning on their way to the country. They take a left and a right, stop at the usual checkpoints, present their documents to the occupying forces. It's the same familiar route dad takes every day of the week when he drives to work. On their drive, the family encounters a group of white men armed with semi-automatic weapons. The men are digging in the middle of the road, presumably to plant an improvised bomb. The film plays with the racial coding of language, describing the men's baseball caps as traditional headdress, and their jeans, t-shirts, vests, and jackets as, quote, clothes more typical to tribes from further south, end quote. These men, armed and menacing, are up to no good, but they let the scared family pass by. Unbeknownst to the men in the family, the men are being watched by a Chinese military drone, and the film gives us glimpses of the men from the drone's perspective in the moments leading up to the firing of a Hellfire missile. The missile roundly obliterates the men. The family also dies in the drone strike. Collateral damage. Fast's film invites the viewer to mourn the family as the victims of a drone strike. However, this mourning or even identification with the sympathetically depicted family is destabilized by disorienting elements, namely the occupying Chinese forces and the white men described using racialized language. In this world of disorienting reversals, the film suggests that if empathy and identification depend on the race of the other and the other's proximity to the figure of the white Western subject, so do disidentification and dehumanization. Do drone strikes seem more morally reprehensible when the asymmetrical drone relation is reversed, when it's an Asian state targeting and killing white Americans? The film highlights how much race shapes existing relations of identification and drone violence and how much race structures the existing drone relation itself. The vignette retains the trope of the Orientalist other in the menacing occupying soldiers and the sympathetic West in the loving white family that's threatened and killed by frightening Asian actors. In the film, this failure to destabilize the historic Orientalism and racism that undergirds the history of US drone strikes speaks again to the ethical failure of identification. Within the US, objections to drone strikes are frequently articulated in some kind of version um, of this is horrible, um, because just imagine what if we're, what was happening over there were happening over here. Fast's film reveals that this protest's simple reversal is woefully inadequate as an ethical gesture because the hypothetical question is itself shaped by colonialist logic that views Western lives, though only certain Western lives, as unacceptable victims of drone violence. The film highlights that this colonialist logic is a constant, that it persists in shaping the world. Indeed, this question itself emerges from a colonialist logic that attempts identification, but reveals the Eurocentrism and racial exclusion that undergird this process of identification. 
In other words, such appeals to identification and empathy are insufficient because they emerge from the same racialized logics that shape drone violence itself. What might be necessary instead is a relation that embraces unfamiliarity, difference, and the failure to overcome difference, something akin to what Edouard Glissant, a Martinican poet and philosopher, calls the right to opacity. The right to opacity, according to Glissant, is the fundamental right to not be seen or known from the perspective of Western thought with its centuries of powerful but limited epistemologies. Feminist science studies scholar Donna Haraway notes that seeing is always seen from somewhere. And this somewhere is always shaped by our specific embodiments, situated perspectives, and only ever partial knowing. So if seeing is always seen from somewhere, seeing is always not seen from somewhere else. In other words, it's important to understand the limits of one's own knowledge formations. What does my situated perspective allow me to know, and what can't I know from this perspective? Glissant's right to opacity points to epistemologies that center the Western post-enlightenment subject as radically incomplete knowledge projects that refuse to see what they don't know, particularly in relation to the human. Throughout the interview segments, Brandon, with his blurred face and masked voice, describes what it's like to see the world from 5,000 feet, which is the optimal height for drone surveillance, according to Brandon. He also talks about playing video games to blow off steam after work, what the world looks like through the drone's infrared technology, the first time he killed someone in a drone strike, and his struggles with post-traumatic stress disorder. In the interview segments, the film shifts from a shot of Brandon's blurred face to aerial shots of archetypal American spaces and familiar cinematic scenes, such as the quaint village, the idyllic suburb, suburban neighborhood, and the Las Vegas Strip at night. For example, in the first interview segment, as Brandon describes the process of aiming a missile at a target, the film cuts to an aerial shot following a young child biking on a dirt road. We see the child on the bike mostly as a shadow. Is this child a boy? If so, then this boy seems to be on the cusp of the child-adolescent boundary that defines the category of military-aged male. Would a drone operator identify this child as a child, thus letting them live, or as an adolescent boy, and thus killable? As Brandon speaks, it's, at first it's unclear how his words work with the aerial shots that they overlay. As the camera follows the child on their bike, Brandon describes watching targets using different drone cameras. As Brandon continues, the camera slowly zooms out, the child becoming no more than a speck, as the dirt road is revealed to be the entrance to a vast suburban enclave, yet another Ameri archetypal American space. In the opening of these aerial shots, the camera's movement through these iconic American spaces is smooth and soothing. But as Brandon's descriptions progress, the camera's movements begin to work in concert with his descriptions of targeting, killing, and of his PTSD, and the camera perspective begins to evoke the drone perspective. Like the recasting of actors in the operator's first story, these interview segments first present the viewer with familiar cinematic shots of familiar spaces, then pull a kind of bait and switch, not unlike the Las Vegas con couple in the operator's second story. Then, too late, the viewer realizes that these soothing, cinematically familiar scenes have seamlessly become aligned with Brandon's view from a drone. In other words, the film coaxes the viewer to participate in these soothing shots, moving through the suburb, the quiet village, and the Las Vegas Strip, only to align these scenes and the viewer's participation within them with Brandon's work surveilling and killing. As the film reveals, the camera perspective, with its familiar shots caressing cherished American spaces, has always been the drone perspective, with its absolute refusal to see black and brown humans as humans worthy of life, grief, and mourning. These two perspectives, the film suggests, are one and the same. The final interview segment concludes on a simultaneously peaceful and fraught evening shot of Las Vegas. Meanwhile, Brandon talks about killing his first target and, quote, when the dream started, end quote. Immediately after, the film cuts to the same shot on which it begins, a shot of the fictional drone operator in the hotel hallway. In the original installation piece, the film is played on a continuous loop, the scenes repeating endlessly. In this recursive structure, both film and installation suggest that disorientation foundationally characterizes both war and representation. 
Further, the film has continually subverted the viewer's desire to identify with the character and to identify with the camera. Fast's film points to an ethical relation that rejects identification with the familiar, the known, and the predictable. Instead, the film locates the ethical outside of identification, and instead in disorientation, uncertainty, the inability to know, and the right to opacity. The works of drone art I discussed highlight the dehumanizing refusal to recognize the victims of drone strikes as humans worthy of grief, if not life, independent of their resemblance to the figure of the white Western subject. These works of drone art locate de dehumanization not in drone victims, but in the US and the West with their histories and continued practices of racial state violence, both domestically and overseas. In the face of this dehumanization, identification that privileges familiarity to the figure of the white Western subject is inherently limited in its capacity to open up ethics. These artworks work against cybernetic warfare's central fantasies of omniscience, total calculability, and predictability. Instead, these works turn to relations that highlight difference, the unknown, and the disorienting to challenge drone dehumanization and the abiding conceptions of the Western subject this dehumanization supports. In doing so, these works gesture to a different conception of the human, one that is constituted not in the image of the Western subject. Instead, these works point to a conception of the human that is defined through an embrace of the unfamiliar, the unseeable, the unknown, and the always yet to be known, particularly from the perspective of Western thought. In this way, these artworks point to the possibility of reconfiguring the human as an unimaginably capacious category that operates outside of identification and refuses drone technologies dehumanizing racial exclusions. Thank you. to the civilized world three times, of course, in contrast to Iran. So I was wondering if you could talk about the continued trope or the relationship between some sort of technological adva or advancement or tool or even an imagined technological supremacy and civility and the category of human or the enlightenment human specifically. Yeah, uh, that's uh, excellent. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Um, this, yes. Uh, a, a notion of technological prowess, technological supremacy, technological progress, right, has always been uh, deeply connected to the ways that uh, um, uh, uh, definitions of civility uh, have emerged. And it's always been, um, and this is a kind of, uh, I think central kind of move within what uh, Edward Said called Orientalism, right? Where it's about um, uh, the West deciding that they're going to define what is technology, what is technological progress, what is technological prowess and supremacy, and then use that definition as everything that we are, right? Um, uh, link it to to to. Um, to civilization to being civilized um, and then define um, the other the against that right as as um, in kind of contra in opposition right so this is a kind of ongoing um, conversation that goes to very much that um, speaks to conversations about power about who has the power to define these these terms right um, I think um, something that we there there are places that places that have largely been imagined as uncivilized um, have largely been also imagined as you know needing technology right um, te Western technology for example the whole one laptop per child you know um, uh, uh, project right about um, dropping laptops uh, uh, to uh, children in. Africa, right? Where in Africa? In Africa, right? Um, and so, um, 
in a non-specific Africa, uh, as if um, people in African countries didn't have their own highly developed modes of technology, right? Um, so it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's really about the power to define the terms. Yeah. Hi, um, also, yeah, thank you. This is great. Um, excited to hear more from you later. I have these two juxtaposing thoughts as you were talking, and one is, um, I recently attended another talk about the use of indigenous American naming systems for drones, um, and that's also, you know, uh, planes and things too before your drones. But um, so on the one hand, this sort of appropriation of um, people of color for actually naming the technology. Uh, and this sort of racist savagery uh, connotation. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. on the other hand, thinking through um, the remarkability of uh, how good drones are at killing people of color yeah. when robot vision, quote unquote, uh, is uh, documentedly poor at yeah. recognizing mm -hmm. people of color. Mm -hmm. And so these two, this sort of juxtaposing image of appropriation and, and killing and uh, how people of color are involved in both of these uh, aspects was sort of stark to me. Yeah, and I think, yeah, it's very complex, right? The ways that, that um, uh, Appropriation and uh, um, discrimination, you know, are you know kind of uh, so are are entangled in very complicated ways. Um, uh, I think there a number of, of uh, scholars of technology are really looking to um, uh, indigenous communities to um, to uh, uh, people of color to to, it's an ongoing debate about, you know, entering more of the technological professions, right, and having more of a say and, and kind of more as if, as one way of, of having more power within those fields and those technologies. Um, I think there's also something very much to be said about, um, you know, uh, looking at the history of, of these technologies of AI, for example, in particular, how they have been very much kind of developed alongside um, a kind of um, uh, a kind of exclusionary, kind of uh, racially biased uh, models of the human. Um, whether that's something that, that, that is, whether intervention is, is the way to go versus, you know, kind of, um, Rejection. I think it's it's an ongoing conversation, and and I'm I'm swayed by people who who think politically in uh, about these things in terms of st strategic um, uh, momentary decisions, as opposed to this is what it's this is the path forward, and this is always what's going to be in every situation, right? But that each situation um, warrants its own careful consideration about how to navigate these very complicated dynamics. Yeah. Um, yeah, and here and then here. Um, so I was wondering if you could speak a little more to how the figure of the child is mm -hmm. being used across mm -hmm. all, I mean, not only in terms of like the military as you're either a child or a combatant, right? right. Um, but also in terms of the artists and, and critics themselves also leveraging the, the child. Mm -hmm. um, it reminds me a lot of uh, Rebecca Sheldon's book, The Child to yeah. Come. Um, and like the Daisy commercials from the Lyndon Johnson campaign mm -hmm. of like, oh, well, the military, like we either have to protect ourselves because we have to protect the children, right? And so I was interested here in, in seeing why that particular figure is being leveraged in these ways um, in both kind of interesting yeah. subversive ways, but also in ways that are very much in line with like typical American yeah. white capitalist narratives. That is so interesting. Um, and I really appreciate that remark. I, I love Rebecca Sheldon's work. Um, you know, I, this is something I'd really like to think about more. Off the top of my head, I'm going to say that I think the, the, um, the installation piece, not a bug spot, I think that might operate differently, right? Um, because it's working as a response to an explicit uh, kind of um, 
military category. Um, to me, that seems less like the ch a child is invoking uh, the future, right? Um, as opposed to a child uh, invoking the immediate as a kind of uh, emergency, uh, as a kind of um, crisis that exists in the present, as opposed to a kind of symbolic um, uh, gesture towards the future and what we have to kind of salvage and recuperate for the future. So. linguistics and the way that, that language shapes this dehumanization process. Oh, that sounds so interesting. Uh, and I'm also thinking about it specifically in relationship not just to the policies created, but the way that something visual, mm -hmm. like something seen by a drone, for example, or any creative work, mm -hmm. uh, the process of becoming uh, technological is a sort of linguistic process. So translating visuals to language. Uh, I'm thinking specifically about like Mel Chen and the way that he writes uh, about how language creates this hierarchy of human, you know, yeah. uh, authority. Uh, and I'm wondering if you've ever, if you've given any consideration to that process of not just uh, the way that that visuals, which are non-linguistic, become technology via linguistics. Uh, you know, like if we were to take this data and decide how it becomes something relevant, but also how that language process becomes a policy that will affect yeah. that. Yeah. I'm told I'm supposed to use the mic, so <laughs> that's why. Um, it also gives me a chance to think um, uh, about this really insightful um, set of comments here. Um, yeah, that's wonderful. Um, I really appreciate that. Thank you. I also wonder about, um, for me, one of the first things I'd want to look into here is causality, right? Is it that um, I wonder if the causality can is 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 as as kind of um, linear as that, right? Um, uh, visual and um, correct me if I get if I get this wrong. So visual technologies become a kind of language that become a kind of policy, right? Because I think um, histories and and of of all of these different um, elements are so kind of entangled previously, I would argue too that policy is already influencing the visuals before that they, they then became language, that before, right? So that there's a kind of constant recursive maybe analysis that we would have to do in order to kind of um, tease out how exactly that those processes are. Yeah, yeah, but I think, yeah, I love that. I, I'm gonna be thinking about that uh, for a long time, so thank you. Um, Thank you so much. So one of the things that started, I started thinking a lot about was the beginning of the talk towards and partnering it with the end about drone operators a little bit. I wonder if you could speak to a little bit about the juxtapositions of like the military industrial industry in general and like predatory attitudes of how to get more bodies on the line and often doing it with marginalized populations and black and brown Americans being on the front lines. Mm -hmm. Thinking about drone operators and this idea that drones are automated despite the fact that there are operators involved that, like you mentioned, suffer from PTSD. Mm -hmm. So thinking a little bit more in depth about the labor of drone operators and dehumanization, could you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, yes. Let's bring DARPA into the and um, into the and actually my my book is organized around kind of loosely organized around kind of a, a loose history of DARPA funded robotics projects. So Eliza was funded by DARPA. Those emotional robots that I showed um, are were funded by DARPA. So there's a um, uh, and obviously the drones were funded by DARPA, right? Um, so. Um, so this question about the labor of drone, yeah, it's it's even more complicated um, because uh, drone operators are often kind of uh, seen by their peers as not masculine enough, right? Not in having the same kind of military masculine strength and um, bravery and courage. So um, uh, 
a few years ago, they, the, they, the military was debating whether or not um, drone operators could be eligible for certain military awards, right? Medals of bravery, things like that. Um, they decided no. Right? So, so um, there's the kind of um, there's a kind of perspective that um, drone operators are also subjected to that they're kind of video game jockeys, right? And so there's a kind of um, uh, kind of demasculinization of them in certain ways. Um, so, but yeah, the work of the drone operator um, is a lot of it takes place in Arizona and in. in you know, in um, outskirts of Las Vegas, often it's it's um, them sitting in a trailer, um, this, uh, an enclosed trailer with a lot of screens, um, just just watching, right, for days on end. So actually, there's a, a number of drone operators, particularly those who who are are battling uh, PTSD, talk about the tremendous um, intimacy that they. De then develop with their targets because they spend so much time surveilling them. They know them so well, right? Um, and so that is a kind of um, relationship that emerges from that, that work. Um, there's also, um, uh, drone operators have also talked about the, the significant psychological challenges of doing this work, sitting in those trailers for 16 hours a day or whatever, right? And then Leaving and then having to go pick up, um, do do some kind, pick up their kid from soccer practice, right? So that juxtaposition is also a deeply um, uh, kind of challenging one for for uh, the drone operators in terms of how they're understanding the work. And then, of course, as as Brandon in a section um, that that I didn't talk about, also talks about the fact that drone operators, uh, many drone operators are affected by by the, the work of killing, you know, that they're doing. As much as the military, um, uh, as much as the language it, that it, it is inculcating them to, to dehumanize, you know, the, the individuals, calling them ants, calling them bug splats, you know, um, uh, calling them all sorts of horrific things, de dehumanizing, you know, names, um, that's not, that's not how a number of drone operators experience that work and, and um, uh, seeing uh, some people killed, so. Um, it may, not, may, may or may not be the best question to uh, hand, hand with, but you know, I was just thinking about Peter Gallison's article that you mm. cited, so I believe the title was Ontology of the Enemy. Mm. Um, and, um, I'm a historian, so I guess the question's more historical, right? I'm trying to tell what the difference between the kind of, you know, uh, objectification that was going on in that narrative versus what happens with modern, you know, drone warfare is. I mean, if I understand it correctly, you know, I think what's similar is that in a war context, you always tend to sort of, you know, cast the enemy as other. Um, uh, but the difference, you know, in that case, you know, it's sort of one mathematician sort of thinking abstractly mm -hmm. with fairly rudimentary technologies, and there's a bit where, you know, it's the mathematical formula that's being used to represent the enemy com uh, combatant, uh, which they have to model in order for the, the, you know, fire control system to actually hit that plane, and it actually turns out it doesn't work at all, you know, to the kind of much more, I mean, if you work with Haraway, you know, the kind of interpolation between the, the human and the machine is much more complex in the case of the, you know, the drone, you know, leading to all kinds of much more complex phenomena about, you know, how you consider, you know, the, the, the enemy. So I think this connects to the last conversation we're having, but I was wondering if you could help sort of unpack, you know, what more of some of these differences are. Yeah. Um, I think there, there are a number of things um, points here that maybe we can think together on um, uh, without necessarily coming to a, a concrete conclusion. I think the first thing is um, uh, that I was really kind of, um, that really resonated f with me on the Gallison article was the way that it wasn't all enemy enemies who were constructed in this dehumanized way, right? It was explicit, the German enemies retained their humanity, right? 
Um, so it's explicitly the Japanese soldiers who, who um, so part of, on the one hand, I, 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 I agree with you about Haraway's, um, Haraway op, bringing Haraway in, offering a, a kind of much more complex kind of um, uh, enfolding of, of human machine, um, particularly in, as it pertains to the drone. But I'm also, I guess, really um, uh, um, interested in highlighting the kind of, um, uh, the kind of um, larger kind of colonialist and, and um, uh, kind of underpinnings, right? Uh, that, that, condition, that created conditions for, for Wiener to do his work, right? Um, and that, condition, that created condition, and that continued to shape the conditions for contemporary drone warfare. So I think it's, it, that to me feels a little bit more like a kind of uh, colonial and geopolitical, right? Um, uh, um, aspect that I think Wiener's article for me was really helpful in extracting. And then, um, uh, and I think, yes, Haraway does always offer such complexity, always with an eye towards like possibilities for recuperation or, you know, some kind of um, um, mode of, of possibility or hope. Um, I'm still, I think, on the flip side, I think we might understand the ways that the project of dehumanization for, unfortunately, for drone operators suffering from PTSD is always an incomplete one, right? Um, and this is one where they're confronted with that in a very real and immediate way and, and suffer for it. Um, Thank you. That's a, oh, I love that question. Yeah. Well, uh...